It's my pleasure to introduce Jonah Gula. Um, I'm going to stop my share so you can pull up the slides. Um, environmental niche distribution models of the endemic Afrotropical storks. And um, a reminder in the chat, I linked a little bit earlier at the top the um, nomination form. So throughout the week, as you're taking notes on student presenters, please be sure to nominate um, the, the presentations that you're, you're enjoying. All right, Jonah, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, everyone can hear me and can see the slides fine. Hoping. No slides yet. No slides? No slides, slides yet. yet. Oh, hmm. Let me. There we go. Okay. You can see it now. Yes, and I'm going to um, interrupt you at 17 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. I'm really excited to talk about a part of my master's research at Texas State University, um, where Clay is my advisor. And this is just one part of my thesis that is on niche modeling for African storks. Um, and so just to get started, I'm, I'm gonna be, all my research um, for this talk is on six species of African storks. Um, these six species here, and just want to kind of talk about them generally to start off. Um, these are the six species that are only found in Africa. There are two other species that occur in Africa seasonally, the black stork and the white stork, but they're Palearctic migrants, and so they're spending part of the year in Europe. And so I'm only focusing on these ones that spend, um, are in sub-Saharan Africa year round. Um, storks as a group, especially in Africa, are notoriously understudied and besides, you know, basic life histories, like what they eat, um, maybe habitats that they occur in, we don't really know a lot about their ecology and we definitely don't know a lot about how their populations are doing. Um, so their status assessments by the IUCN are kind of dubious. Um, all six of these species are assessed as least concern. And then you see here on the slide the respective population trends. But the fact is that we just don't really know enough to make this call about how they're doing. We don't have um, standardized population surveys. So, you know, these are sort of made up, these, um, these statuses and population numbers. And, you know, without those and without basic ecological information, um, we can't develop actual science based assessments. So where my research comes in is just getting at some of the basic questions about these species as we eventually work towards developing status assessments that are empirical. And so my research, um, part of it that I'm not going to talk about here is just mapping distribution because surprisingly no one's even done that. So just answering the question, where do they actually occur? Because generally throughout you know, the past few decades, just ubiquitous distribution across Sub-Saharan Africa has been assumed and inappropriately, as I have found um, for most species. And then the question that I'm gonna be addressing here is why do they occur there? Because we don't really have any understanding of just their basic environmental requirements, which is pretty important if we're gonna um, be looking at you know, population trends and things that are threatening their populations. And so for each of those six species, um, as I'm talking about you know, the, the methods here, I'm talking about, I'm doing the same thing for all six species. And these were sort of the objectives of the modeling for each species. So just predicting where there's actually suitable areas based on the variables that I use, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, assessing how important each of these variables is in contributing to where they occur, and then how they respond to each variable. And then looking, you know, after having the models of suitability, looking at overlap to see how similar their niches are. And I'm going to be talking about just continental scale models here, but I'm also working on regional models. 
um, for West, Central, East, and Southern Africa, because, um, well, as I'm finding already, there are um, some scale dependencies. But what I'm talking about here is just at the continental scale. So just keep that in mind as I'm you know, talking about my results. So these are the data that I used to build the models. So first, I have climate, uh, climate variables from the World Climate Database, which is annual and seasonal temperature and precipitation extremes and averages. And after eliminating um, strongly correlated variables, I, the model input puts included nine climate variables of temperature and precipitation. Um, also vegetation cover from the globe cover project, which is satellite derived vegetation categories from the European Space Agency. And these are pretty broad categories. So um, you just have to keep that in mind too. They're, they're very general. And then I personally collated thousands of records for each of these six species from online sources like eBird, um, Southern African Bird Atlas Project 2, iNaturalist, West African Bird Database, those kind of sources where there's a lot of data. And then I also went through a lot of literature dating as far back as the 1890s and, and pulled um, localities that you know, I could actually geo-reference. And so all of that was put into a database for each species and, and used in these models. And um, as I said, sort of in the beginning, there's a model being built for each species. So I'm doing all of this for the six species. I built models in a program called Maxent. Um, if you're not familiar with Maxent, it is pretty widely used. It's a machine learning algorithm and it has a lot of benefits. Um, there's a lot of research that has showed that it outperforms other predictive distribution models. And so that's what one reason I chose it. It also doesn't require absent, absence data, which is pretty significant and useful because of course, presence only data is a lot easier to come by than, than true absences. Um, the models are assessed, their predictive capacity is assessed using the area under the curve metric or AUC, which is essentially a probability that a presence record will be selected over a random background record. And this ranges from zero to one because it's a probability. And so as the AUC approaches one, that indicates that the predictive capacity is improving and values that are over 0.75 are generally considered to have pretty good performance. Um, and so that's how I measured um, model predictive capacity. Maxent also allows you to do a bunch of model replicates. And so I ran 50 replicate models for each species because if I did any more, my computer probably would have exploded. Um, but these produce averages of the models because the Maxent algorithm follows can follow slightly different paths between each model run that might produce some slight variation in the outputs. And so by doing a bunch of replicates, I'm able to average them. And then at the same time, it is able to test the different models against one another. And so that's one advantage of Maxent as well. And then while it's doing that at the same time, it's running jackknife, jackknife tests that are removing a variable during each run and then assessing how that impacts the AUC. And then that results in a, a ranking of variable importance, um, which ones are contributing the most to AUC. And so I just want to talk about the top three um, most important variables, which were the same throughout all species, which is part of the um, interesting findings. And so annual precipitation was the number one most important variable for all six species, um, which is the cumulative annual precipitation, not the mean, like in a month or whatever. Um, and this is their response to variation in annual precipitation when all the other variables are held constant at their means. And so you can see, there's my mouse, um, you know, the different species here, but they all have a very similar response, um, you know, in this range of annual precipitation, except for the woolly neck, which has this high response or this really positive response at high annual precipitation. And the regional modeling that I'm, I'm working on right now 
has showed that this is um, can be attributed to their occurrence in the wettest parts of West Africa, where the highest amount of rain falls in on the whole continent. So there seems to be this optimum for all of the species minus the, um, the woolly neck of annual precipitation. Um, and outside of this range, you know, the probability of occurrence, which is on the y axis here, uh, drops off pretty steeply. Um, precipitation in the warmest quarter was either number two or number three for all species. I didn't want to break it down individually because it could just get a little convoluted, but it was um, ranked as number two or number three for all of them. And you can see that there's this negative relationship. So as precipitation in the warmest quarter of the year increases, there's a decreasing probability of occurrence, which is really interesting and probably um, attributed to, you know, it's hard because we're dealing with a number of species. So there's probably species specific um, reasons for this, but this is probably attributed to seasonal foraging requirements. So during certain parts of the year, especially during breeding or around the time that chicks are fledging, they really require lower water levels because aquatic prey becomes concentrated. And um, there's really only one study that has looked in this in African storks and the marabou stork, and um, that was in Swaziland. And they actually found that increased precipitation during the breeding season actually decreased nest success. And so that sort of reflects, um, you know, overall this, this relationship here during the warmest quarter, which is often when breeding is occurring in most regions. And then finally, vegetation cover ranked as number two or three for all the species. Um, again, these are really broad categories, so keep that in mind. I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but these are the categories where the species had a greater than 75 percent probability of occurrence. And the takeaways are that um, not all species, you can see here, these three are the only ones that responded strongly um, positively to flooded woodland. And then down here, the saddleville is sort of the exception for savannas. And I just lumped the cropland categories together. There's a few of them, but the saddleville did not respond very strongly um, positively to those like the other species did. So there's, there's some difference there. And then also developed areas doesn't necessarily mean um, like towns, it's just where there's artificial surfaces like roads. And so you have to keep that in, in mind as well. And I just wanna quickly go through the prediction maps for each species. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on these, but um, you'll see the AUC uh, value down here. Remember greater than 0.75 indicates the models performed very well, which all of them did. And particularly pay attention to the predictions in West Africa, where there's relatively low suitability compared to the rest of the continent, especially East and Southern. So that's for the open bill, the abdoms here, which is a true migrant or complete migrant. And so I wanna look at, um, look at temporal scales here because that might be affecting this output. Um, the saddle bill has relatively low uh, suitabilities out here in West Africa and not as extensive um, suitabilities in other parts of the continent like some of the other storks. Marabou, same thing for West Africa. Um, so th these all have very similar trends. Same thing for the yellow-billed stork. And then for the African woolly neck, it probably had the um, most patchy and restricted areas of suitability and also probably has the um, highest suitability in West Africa as far as the amount of area that the high suitability predictions cover, which is probably reflective of that response to the high annual rainfall. And then so after getting these um, suitability predictions, I compared niche overlap using a program called ENM Tools to calculate, calculate um, I, which is a metric used for assessing overlap that was developed by Dan Warren and colleagues, and they actually created e &M tools as well. And the value of I ranges between zero and one, where zero indicates no overlap in the environmental suitability, so um, very dissimilar niches. And then one indicates that they're identical. 
And so this, it does this, you know, in pairwise comparisons and all of the pairwise comparisons for these six species found um, are estimated I to range from 0.91 to 0.99, which is very high overlap. So as far as these variables go in these models, their niches are almost identical, um, which is pretty interesting and sort of indicates that, okay, at this large scale, there's not um, niche partitioning going on, at least with, you know, climatic variables, but so sort of a next step is, okay, maybe it's occurring at small habitat scales. There's research um, from India with some of the storks there that show they use different water levels. And of course, because of different sizes, um, different bill morphologies, they're, they have different prey. And so maybe that's something that influences distribution on a smaller scale or even just interactions with one another if they are overlapping in their prey. And so the, the implications of this, um, you know, looking at a continental scale, of course, there's a lot of nuance and have to keep that in mind. But one of the, the most striking things to me from this niche modeling and from just mapping distribution is the limited um, distribution and distribution suitability predictions in West Africa. Um, there's been some pretty significant declines of a few species there in the past 40 to 50 years particularly the marabou, open bill, saddle bill, and yellow bill, um, where they've even been extirpated from some countries. And so that's where I think the um, regional models are gonna be important that I'm working on. And most likely these declines are related to long-term drought in like the Sahel region. And so the findings from this model make sense based on what we're seeing, you know, in declines there in West Africa, because that they, they peer, appear to have this optimal amount of annual precipitation or, or range of annual precipitation. And so a long-term climate event like the drought in the Sahel um, is gonna make them susceptible to, maybe they're even moving out of an area or they're um, you know, becoming extirpated there for um, lack of suitable conditions. And so you know, moving forward with, with climate predictions for West Africa, things aren't really going to um, improve there as far as the conditions that these storks require. And so they're, they're pretty sensitive in areas like this and also at, in um, other parts of the range periphery where conditions are, are already sort of marginal. And then finally, moving forward, um, of course, we need data from the field to look at population level responses to this variation. And as I said before, just basic population estimates because we can have this information about their environmental requirements, but we don't have any idea of how many are out there and what the population trends are. Um, we can't have empirical status assessments. So with that, I just wanted to thank all these people that um, contributed data and helped me throughout this process. It was pretty amazing just the number of people that provided um, you know, personal sightings and, and data from other research throughout Africa. And thank you. Thank you, Jonah. I'm going to have you unshare your screen and we'll allow the next speaker to share the next slides while we can entertain one or two questions. Does anybody have a question for Jonah? I do. Kate, go ahead. Thanks, Jonah, for a great talk. Um, so you showed maps of the suitability. Um, habitat suitability, what do we know about the overlap in the actual range, range distribution between these species? They're, they're pretty similar. And that's sort of the other part of my research that I didn't talk about. They're pretty similar. Um, it's, it's really comparable to the way that their niches overlap actually. Um, there's some species that haven't declined as much in West Africa, so they still exist there where some have disappeared. But overall, they're, they're very similar, like the niches. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Jonah. I have a question. I'm Shuridam. Uh, so I have like uh, several questions. And it, it, it was really a beautiful talk. But uh, you showed that woolly neck stock, it has a different response against the rainfall. So why do you think it uh, responded differently 
and the second one is that you showed that with increasing warmness the species richness it declines so do you think it, it is a really uh, important factor in especially when you think in context of global warming and the third question is the niche modeling you said about uh, you did a niche overlap measurement and uh, how would i could not understand the which particular niche dimension you are talking about whether it's the feeding uh, overlap or the habitat overlap or the space overlap which one is it thanks a lot um so the first question about the woolly neck they are the only species that occurs very um prominently on in coastal west africa and that's where the most rainfall occurs and so that is one one of the major differences between them their distribution and other species and so that's probably why there's the different response because they occur throughout the very wet areas of west africa um as far as the decrease um in probability of occurrence for um precipitation during the warmest quarter i think that that is probably related to um the breeding period where they require less rainfall in order for fish or or frogs to become concentrated it makes them easier makes it easier for them to provision young and and they're going to go to areas where there's better foraging conditions and then for the niche overlap um it's just looking at the comparison between the suitability scores that the model produces so each cell of the model has the probability of occurrence based on all the variables and so it's not looking at each individual variable comparing overlap it's looking at the model's predictions for overall probability of occurrence okay thanks a lot jona that's what, that was an amazing talk thanks a lot thank you um it appears to me that our next speaker is not present um and i i don't have a a file that was submitted on their behalf so we could continue this conversation um i i think we should stay on schedule so that people joining us at um 11 for sordan's talk won't miss it um so any other questions or comments jona i i thought your graphics were really really nice in telling your story so that was a a very well put together slide show oh thank you for someone that is not at all familiar with waders and that part of the world um i learned a lot this morning good i'm glad i'm glad there's a lot when you're covering six species there's a lot to cover and so i kind of glossed over those maps but um there's a lot of nuance in the the predictions and you know things for the different species that i didn't really get to talk about Well, that's that's the exciting part of science, right? There's no end to the questions, yeah. the details that you can explore. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Are you serving as a a TA um during as a graduate student TA right now? I was, but I actually finished my coursework in May and so I'm not at Texas State like in right. body at the moment. Okay. Um yeah. So so you're not uh dealing with the the covid hybrid online <laughs> teaching us a <laughs> job. Thankfully not. I got out of there right in time. I'm sure Clay's loving it. <laughs> yes, but Joan will forget to tell you that he got stuck in Belize during the the uh <laughs> covid pandemic. Oh, yes. wow. And that actually this is my thesis now because my original project was field work in Zambia and so I had to pivot to this. Um but you know, it worked out. That's another life lesson in science. You got to pull <laughs> with the punches and jump on opportunities as they come to you. <laughs> yep, exactly. Excellent. Hey Joan, I have a question. I'll put you on the spot, but you can defer to Gopi as well since he's the co-chair of the, you know, Stork Ibis Boombill group, but you mentioned that the IUCN, you know, status is is dubious. I don't I don't disagree but I you know you and Gopi know a lot more about these species than I do but in your connections you know and I looked at that long list of acknowledgments um are you working with the that specialist group to try to I know I know what you were doing wasn't population counts right but are you working with them to try to 
find individuals that have more data and more information to get a better assessment of these species to potentially change their IUC and red list status? Yeah, so because I've been focused on the saddleable for so long, um, that's, those are the connections. I've made connections with people about that. And so after doing all this work, um, I'm realizing that the other species are just as poorly understood and, and studied. And for the saddle bill, so that's all I can really speak to, um, in getting this data, all those people that provided locations was a really important step in getting connected with people who have data out there and who are doing, you know, they're doing other research. They're doing mammal surveys in the Sahel or, or whatever. And they're all very enthusiastic, especially about the saddlebill because um, it's very charismatic and, and beautiful and everyone loves it. <laughs> but um, everyone's been very enthusiastic to contribute data, you know, learn how they can help because especially in West Africa, there are a lot of large scale surveys of water birds. And as Gopi mentioned in his talks, um, talk, a lot of them are focused on wetlands from like the international water bird count. And so that's, you know, there's some similar issues there that we need to address outside of protected areas. And everyone is, is very interested in doing that. And so as far as the saddle goes, we're kind of starting to make um, some progress with you know, getting people together to start actually paying attention to these during aerial counts. You know, we're, they're up there counting elephants and buffalo and stuff. Saddable are really easy to detect. So are marabou mm -hmm. and yellow-billed stork. And um, already where I work in Zambia, they're including them in their aerial surveys. So it's a pretty significant step, I think. Anything to add, Gopher? Sure. Yeah, no, except that, you know, his uh, his networking is proving to be very useful. We are going to start a specialized saddle bill stork working group very soon in the uh, specialist group. And we are also beginning to discuss a couple of special issues of our online publication as well. It seems like people have a ton of information on storks, on ibises, and a lot of these large water birds that are fairly very prominent on the landscape. So we are hoping to capitalize on that. And uh, Jonah and I had just started discussing the potential for a special issue uh, of our publication, looking only at the FAP or Inca stocks. And that I think will give us a little bit more leeway into starting broader discussions as uh, people get more aware of how poorly these IUCN status assessments are uh, based on, you know, very incomplete information really. <laughs> so a long yeah. way to go. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really peeved about COVID because I was hoping to join Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. Well, no, and I think, yeah, and Gopi, you and I, uh, I'm trying to talk, but I'm also chuckling because Ian looks like he's birding, which is pretty cool, birding and going to a <laughs> Ian conference. and Patty are birding. Pretty <laughs> 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 merganser. Wow. I love it. I Patty love says it. she's got hooded merganser. Stop it. <laughs> I, exactly what I was about to say. I have put in the ganses right out there. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> wow. All I've got is a northern mockingbird. <laughs> well, we have a couple of Indian night jars calling. There you go. Well, I'm already jealous because you mentioned jaguars outside your farm. So all I've got is feral cats. Um, <laughs> but no, Gopi and Jonah, you know, um, yeah, I think it's good. I think, you know, I agree with what you're saying. And I think, uh, Gopi, I think you know, but, you know, and Jonah, I know we've had the conversation, you know, Chip and I have organized the Herons of the World symposium next year in, in, in Victoria Falls. Uh, and so I think I think there's some synergy we could potentially explore with Storic Spoons bills and ibises and herons and egrets veterans, you know, for Africa. And maybe we should have some more conversations on that. Yeah, the Pan-African Ornithological Congress is also being timed for now. So th that will be very nice to dovetail into theirs or, you know, see if there are opportunities that we can do there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It might be important for the Waterbird Society to send an executive council member to that meeting. I don't know yeah. who that would be, but... The, pre the president in waiting, probably, right? <laughs> probably the president has to come and has got to carry two bottles of wine. Uh, 
Oh, Dan says he's got a blue hair, and I had a blue hair in the yesterday morning, um, but it's not here today yet. We'll see. <laughs> I've often wanted to uh, get some of you guys out here to put a, a tag on this heron of mine. I'm curious. This is the first year we've had two um, all, all summer long, but they're here most of the year. I also have a kingfisher that I like to watch, but it's it's not the white throated that Gopi showed. It's just the yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no, these are these are practically vermin, but the kingfishers in, in the US are so difficult to see the colored. <laughs> so Patty, our next talk is a recorded one. It is. Okay. Uh, but we'll have live question and answer. Oh, excellent. excellent. So it's um, just a connect connectivity issue. So I think yep. it will really yep. well. No, I think that's great.
We're going to be starting up again in just a couple of minutes. I have a, a recording. Is everybody able to see full screen? All right, I think we should get started. We still have um, two presentations left in this session, and I'm going to play the, the presentation by Suradam Roy, um, but he's in attendance and he'll be able to take questions live um, when, we're, when we're finished with this. Hi, everyone. I am Suridam Roy. I'm a PhD student at Nature Conservation Foundation. And today I'll be talking about the musical world of the Sara screen, focusing on duet, its variation and different ecological dependencies of duet. This is a part of my ongoing PhD research. We lost the sound, Patty. I think when you hit mute, Patty, we lost sound. One such behavior is duetting, where the male sars spreads its wings and sings in response to a female-initiated duet. This is how a sars screen duet sounds like, and the open wing one is the male and the closed wing is the female. So what exactly is a duet? A duet is a unified song of two individuals with certain amount of coordination. In case of warblers, duets are mostly overlapping in nature, where the note of the male and the female, they tend to overlap with each other. However, the melodious songbirds are known to use an alternating duetting strategy. Here the male and the female they tend to alternate with each other rather than overlap and the silent gap between successive nodes are also minimal. This type of coordination strategy is believed to be difficult to achieve since it requires learning and experience. If the sound is converted into an image, the tweet of Sarskin will look something like this and it can be separated out into several uh, components. Uh, the duet starts with an introductory note from the female and is responded back by the introductory note from the male. And this marks the ending of the introductory component. Then the female gives out a trill note, which is responded back by the male with a trill. And this marks the end of the trill phase or trill component and marks the beginning of the syllabic component. The syllabic component consists of uh, subsequent male and female uh, notes, either in alternation or overlap. If you look into the distribution of Saraskran in North India, they are highly populated in state of Uttar Pradesh, followed by Gujarat, Haryana, Rajasthan, and several other North Indian states. However, across this distribution, the availability of wetland varies due to different level of wetland attrition across the landscape. And we know that wetland availability is critical for Sara survival. The agricultural intensification also varies according to the region and the vegetation structures such as forest cover, plantation, etc. also may vary. 
Due to the variation in this habitat quality related factors, the breeding pair density also varies across the Sarskran distribution. And that brings us to the question that whether the duet of Sarskran also varies according to the location in its North Indian distribution and whether different ecological factors such as wetland availability, uh, pear density has any role to play in it. And we also incorporated canal availability in the analysis because canals provide water to the croplands and uh, SARS crane nests, nests and thrives in this uh, flooded croplands. I had collected data from September 2019 to March 2020 covering three states and seven districts. The states also varied in their breeding pair density with highest being in Uttar Pradesh followed by Gujarat and Haryana. I also followed an a priori five kilometer to five kilometer grid design. The grids were classified into low, medium and high density grids based on number of pairs monitored in that particular grid under long-term monitoring program. This was used as a proxy for pair density. I had also taken measurement of uh, presence or absence of small or large wetland or small or large canal near the territory of the Sarah screen. And if there were no uh, wetlands present, the score was zero. If there was a small wetland present, the score was one. If there was a large wetland present, the score was two. And if both small and large wetland present, then the score was three. Similarly, for canal availability, the score ranged from zero to three. I had used a shotgun microphone to record the duets that I had obtained via playback or often uh, uh, unprovoked natural interaction between the neighbors. And uh, I had used Raven Pro 1.6 and RStudio 1.3 for subsequent analysis. Once we import the duet recording into Raven Pro software, we can put selection boxes around the individual notes and we can uh, we can obtain several note specific information from the selection boxes, such as minimum frequency, maximum frequency, the bandwidth, uh, the peak frequency or the dominant frequency of the note, the duration of the note, uh, the sex of that of the singer and from which particular component that note belong to, whether it belong from a, a syllabic component or trill or an intro. So these are all uh, note specific information uh, within a duet and I used mean value of all the notes within a duet to find the overall minimum frequency of the duet, overall maximum frequency of the duet and subsequently for uh, for the variables up till this node duration. And uh, there are also duet specific information uh, such as the duet duration, which is the difference between the start and end of the duet signal, number of notes uh, that were sung within a duet, the tempo, which is the number of notes sung in uh, per second, and uh, the duet coordination score that I obtained using Warbler R package in R. And whenever there were multiple duets available for a particular pair, I uh, used the I averaged the, the duet specific uh, values uh, for that particular pair. The Warbler R package in R uh, identifies the individual male and female signals and maps them within the duet, and also identifies the overlapping region, regions between the male and female signals and calculates the total amount of uh, overlap within uh, this duet in seconds. And then it shuffles the male and female signals and the silent gaps between them uh, to uh, produce a null distribution of uh, random overlaps. Then it uh, obtains a mean random overlap, mean random overlap from that. And the coordination score is calculated as observed overlap minus mean random overlap divided by mean random overlap. And the coordination score can range from positive infinity to negative infinity, where a higher negative score suggests an alternative duetting strategy and a higher positive score suggests, suggests an overlapping duetting strategy. And the scores close to zero suggests non-adherence to any particular strategy or these are the less coordinated duets. So the lower coordination score suggests a higher coordination 
within the duet and a, a higher coordination score which is close to zero suggests a lower coordinated duet. I had run correlation tests between the variables obtained from RavenPro software and found a strong correlation between minimum frequency and peak frequency, maximum frequency and bandwidth, duet duration and number of nodes and uh, node duration and the tempo. However, in case of tempo and node duration, the collision was in opposite direction. With this, I had selected these variables for subsequent PCA analysis. The principal component analysis showed that the first four principal components accumulated for almost 90% variation. And if you see in PC1, there is a potential for variation across three states in terms of duet duration and node duration. Across PC2, there is a potential for variation in terms of peak frequency and bandwidth. Across PC3, there was clear indication of a, a variation in terms of duet coordination uh, across three different states. And there was a, a potential for a variation in duet duration as well as duet bandwidth as seen through PC4. We use linear regression to find the duet properties, which varied uh, significantly according to the state. And we found that duet coordination varied significantly uh, across three states, and the pairs in Gujarat had a, a much more higher coordinated duet compared to the other two. The bandwidth also differed significantly between Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh, however, it didn't differ significantly between. Gujarat and Haryana. I also use generalized additive models uh, or GAMs to build the relationship between my ecological predictors and different duet properties. GAMs are actually a semi-parametric regression models which are uh, alternative to the GLMs and it uses smoother function instead of uh, straight line and slopes of a GLM uh, so that it can accommodate non-linear data as well. I had used four predictors, the wetland availability, canal availability, the location of the pair, and the pair density within that particular grid. And I'll be discussing only the, uh, only the duet properties which have a significant effect with uh, the predictors. The base model explaining duet coordination showed significant variation according to the location and uh, it had a hump-shaped relationship with uh, wetland availability. Uh, however, there were very few pairs which didn't have any wetlands, any wetland near its territory. Uh, therefore, the overall effect of uh, wetland availability was uh, positive with the duet coordination. This was uh, also supported with the wetland and canal interaction factor, where uh, it was quite clear that with increased wetland availability, the duet uh, duet coordination also improves. Uh, this is in line with the predict uh, with our predictions because uh, the good quality pairs they are likely to occupy the good quality territories and uh, they are also expected to be experienced pairs so that they can uh, also produce a better coordinated duet than others. And the as the pair density increased within the grid, the duet coordination also increased, which is which also again aligns with your prediction that in higher competitive contexts, the pairs are likely to produce uh, better coordinated duets. The model for bandwidth showed significant variation according to the location, and uh, it also it also showed insignificant effect of uh, pair density and wetland and canal interaction term. The, as the pair density increased, the duet bandwidth it decreased, then it plateaued. Uh, and in case of increased wetland availability or increased data quality, the duet bandwidth also increased. Uh, this is in line with our prediction because uh, broad bandwidth sounds are costly to produce. So uh, only the pairs which occupy a good quality territory uh, may actually can afford it. The base model explained duet duration showed significant variation according to the location. And we also wanted to ask whether duet coordination affect the duet duration or not. 
or in other words, the decision to prolong or stop the duet, whether that is dependent on how well the pair mates are coordinating with each other. And we found that as the coordination uh, decreased in a duet, the duration uh, increased. So it might be that the pairs which are which can't produce well coordinated duet, they tried to compensate by singing longer duets. The interaction term didn't have a clear pattern, but it suggested uh, a negative effect of canal availability on duet duration. The earlier regression model showed no significant difference in duet duration across three states. However, GAM model showed significant variation of duet duration according to the location. This implies variation at a finer scale. And we found that pairs in Rotak district of low density site of Haryana sang significantly shorter duets compared to all other districts. The base model explaining tempo showed that the duet tempo didn't vary according to the location. The canal availability had a insignificant but negative effect with the duet tempo. However, there was a positive effect of wetland availability uh, with the with the duet tempo, and this was again uh, with our in line with our predictions, as the good quality pairs are expected to have a higher tempo. Number of nodes had a, a significant relationship with all the predictors except uh, location. Wetland availability had a positive uh, impact on number of nodes, or in other words, as the territory quality improved, pairs sang duets enriched with more nodes. However, an opposite uh, effect was seen in terms of canal availability. So, uh, so as the canal availability improved, the uh, number of nodes get reduced. And similar effect was also seen in wetland and canal interaction term where the uh, canal availability had a negative impact on number of nodes. The pair density also had a negative impact on number of nodes. To summarize, wetland availability or the territory quality had a significant and positive effect on duet coordination, number of nodes within the duet and the duet tempo. The canal availability had a positive impact on duet bandwidth. However, it had a negative relationship with number of nodes and the duet tempo. Finally, the pair density had a positive effect on duet coordination, but had a negative effect on duet bandwidth and number of nodes. We also observed duet variation across uh, the study sites. And the most contributing factor to that was duet, co duet coordination, uh, followed by duet bandwidth, as we have seen the bandwidth between the pairs in Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh varied. And uh, finally, the duet duration as the pairs in Rotak sang significantly shorter duets compared to all other districts. With that, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Suhail Kadar's contribution and valuable suggestions. He's also my co-guide. And I would like to thank my field assistants and their family members for supporting and helping me throughout this journey. I would like to uh, appreciate generous support of ICICI Potential, and uh, finally, I am thankful to my friends and family for being the best support in the world. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thanks a lot. Excellent. I believe Sir Dom is here, and we yeah, yeah, I'm here. And as mentioned, to answer any questions. You can raise your hand, you can jump in, or I'll follow in the chat and try to moderate. All right, well, I'll, I'll start. As a, a non-specialist, I'm wondering if, um, with your location variable, um, is there any, were you able to, to label those locations by human density or urbanization? Anything that might, um, from like a noise pollution standpoint, uh, impact song? Yeah, actually that's an interesting thing. So that's a part of my objective itself. So in subsequent uh, data analysis, we'll, what we'll be doing is we'll be look, looking into the anthropogenic, <clears throat> sorry, anthropogenic buildup areas and different uh, levels of road congestion and the vicinity of the roads to the territory and different anthropogenic related stuff. 
and then we'll try to build how whether these uh, different anthropogenic factors whether they have a role to play in uh, grid variation or not because as we have seen in case of many of the other uh, urban area dwelling birds the minimum frequency gets uh, higher in response to the uh, the noise uh, noise related factors and uh, so in subsequent analysis we will be looking into those factors whether there is a variation in the minimum frequency or bandwidth or a uh, number of notes like the uh, things that are related to the duet quality such as coordination or number of notes whether those things are also get uh, get affected by increasing anthropogenic pressure or not yes thank you we have time for one more question Uh, okay, so from Jenna Schlenner, do these birds have high mate retention? And do you know if the length of partnership impacts these duets? So is it, can you repeat the question? Yes, do these birds have high mate retention? And do you know if the length of the partnership might impact the duetting? Uh, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, so they are known for a long-term pair, they are actually known for, known as a long-term pair bonding bird. and uh, um, actually, duet is most strongly correlated with air round territoriality and uh, long-term pair bonding species. So in that case, yeah, the, the partnership, uh, the length of the partnership should affect these properties. For example, we already know that the coordination, duet coordination takes time to learn and uh, it's an uh, experience different process. So in that case, yeah, it, it, it is a good question to ask whether uh, the length of the partnership or how, whether the, their experience level, whether that also affect their duet coordination or not. Um, it, but at, as, for, as of now, I have a, a info data from particularly one season and we will be definitely looking for other uh, sources, long-term monitoring data and see if this is also a, a, a question that we can answer or not. Thanks, this is a good question. Thanks a lot. Excellent. We have one more presenter, Kate. Kate Schlepper today, and then we do have time after Kate's talk if we'd like to continue the conversation. Thanks a lot, Patty. Thank Signing you. On. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I lost my unmute button. Oh, yes, that's okay. <laughs> too many buttons. Um, okay, thanks everyone. Um, I've got a really long technical title in the abstract book booklet, but it uh, boils down to what you see here on the screen. Um, the reason I'm interested in overheating in chicks is for a very practical reason, and that's that I um, live in South Florida, USA, and we do a lot of um, wading bird colony work our permits all specify certain times of the day where we're not allowed to enter the colonies because of fear of heat stress, but there really aren't any numbers around uh, ambient temperature thresholds or what the actual effect is on the chicks. So this was sort of a mini study to investigate these questions. Uh, so just a reminder what we know about uh, thermoregulation. So the, the basic question of today is what determines body temperature in a bird? And thermoregulation, um, these are endothermic animals, so they are trying to maintain a stable core internal body temperature. Um, and they spend energy to maintain that temperature if the ambient temperature is pushing them outside of that optimal range. So here's a prediction graph based on just basic physiology. And you'll note that I have this term core and this term extremity, different colors. You'll see this throughout the whole talk today. Um, so when I say core, I'm thinking about pectoral muscles, the heart, um, the brain. So these are the, the, the primary organs that the animal wants to protect. And then we'll think about extremities as being like the legs and the beak, places where an animal can dump heat if it's really hot outside. So the first research question, very simply, is are chicks capable of thermoregulating? And this is an interesting question because chicks, when we're talking about very young altricial um, birds, 
the, they are developing their physiological capacity still, and they're also growing really fast. So I'll talk more about that later, but this is our basic first question. As a researcher, we add a level of stress. So I live in South Florida, I enter a wading bird colony, it's already hot outside, and then on top of that, I'm handling a chick, and it encourages this fight or flight reaction. Um, so when the animal's stressed out, uh, respiration is going to pick up, heart rate is going to pick up, brain activity, blood's going to flow to the pectoral muscles. And so all of that um, increases the metabolic heat that is created within the bird. And so I was talking before about um, overheating and how an animal would thermoregulate. Well, this disturbance response sort of complicates what that might look like. We might expect the core to stay the same or heat up, extremities again stay the same, heat up. Um, and so this is really the second question is what happens to the thermoregulatory capability of a chick when you add disturbance on top of heat stress. And then the final complexity I want to touch on today um, is the fact that these chicks are growing. So they go from a little tiny baby baby chick hatching out of an egg um, to this big adult sized bird in just about a month's time. So it's a really fast, um, significant growth. And not only is the internal physiology developing over that time, but there are some just basic characteristics that change the risk that these birds face to overheating. So today we'll think about surface area um, as part of the body where heat can either be absorbed or shed. Volume we'll think about in this context as sort of the core mass that's capable of producing metabolic heat. And then finally is this basic introductory biology principle of the surface area to volume ratio. And so here we have cubes that's simple to think about and quantify, but of course we can think about these cubes as chicks too. And what I want to draw your attention to here is the fact that um, size of a chick and the shape of a chick may have different effects on thermoregulatory capabilities. So in this instance, we have three chicks, we'll pretend they're to scale. And so they're all the same size, but they have very different shapes. So this chick on the left has really long sprawling limbs where it can either absorb or shed heat very readily versus this chick on the right is the same size, but it's round. It has a lot of body mass, but not many, not much in terms of limbs or surface area to shed or absorb that heat. So even though, you, even though you're the same size, um, different surface area to volume ratio is going to affect your thermoregulatory capability. Okay, so I know this is a lot, but I'll try to remind you of these principles as we walk through. Um, oh, so that third question is, do, do these factors, age, size, and, and service area to volume affect thermoregulation? So here are those questions summarized. We have a few predictions that follow. Um, I think these are all very logical. So first of all, you would expect thermoregulation to be more difficult if it's super hot outside um, because you're, there, there's a greater difference between what you want your body to be and what the in external environment is, is forcing your body to be. Secondly, uh, I, as I stated earlier, we expect disturbance to be an added stressor that's going to make it harder to thermoregulate. And finally, we, we're going to think about that interaction between age, size, and shape in, in determining how that affects thermoregulation. So the way that I go about answering these three questions, it's all one set of measure, um, one, one type of measurement, but I've got a pre-handling group. So this is before I pick up the chick and play with it. And then a post-handling group, which is going to be where the way that I test disturbance factors. So finally, 13 slides in, I, I'll tell you that my study species is the wood stork. So we haven't yet, we've covered a lot of storks today, but haven't yet appreciated this one. Um, this is a map of colonies, wood stork wading bird colonies in South Florida. I've highlighted the three that I do research for this project in, and we monitor them during the duration of the breeding season. So from the time that they hatch 
all the way till the time they fledge, which is realistically around 10 weeks. We call fledged for logistical purposes around four weeks. Um, so lots of basic uh, uh, things we measure, ambient temperature, is the nest in the sun or is it in the shade? We record the chick age, we record obvious signs of heat stress, for example, if the chick is panting, um, that's a sign of heat stress. And then for the purposes of our questions today, um, body morphology, so my proxy for surface area is going to be a head bill measurement and my proxy for volume is mass. So this is the heat produced versus heat absorbed or shed. And then of course we can um, divide these out and create this surface area to volume ratio. I'll quickly mention that um, to, in order to make these numbers meaningful, I've looked at surface area to volume in relation to an adult shaped bird. Um, and so the variable you'll see printed on my slides is as a V rel, that's relative to the adult. And then of course we need to measure temperature. So um, here in this little cartoon, you can see I've measured the underwing. So this is a feather free area, even on the old birds. And then my extremity measurement is an ankle or a foot. Um, and so here you see my uh, field assistant Rosie is holding an infrared thermometer. And so it's a contact free skin surface temperature measurement. And so here is a post handling measurement. She's holding the chick right now. Um, but because it's contact free, this is how we're able to get a pre handling measurement as well. So basically I go up to the nest and I measure the chick before I touch it. A couple last things in methods. So first of all, um, as you would expect, age and size of the chick is highly correlated. So for the morphometrics, we go from a head bill of about 50 when the chicks are a week old to three times that size by, the, by age four. So this is part of what makes wood storks a really good species to answer these questions. Uh, and the same is true of age. So mass and age are correlated as we'd expect. Um, but then this added factor of shape. So age and size, of course, are correlated, but then how does, how does that surface area to volume ratio fit into this? And it turns out that surface area to volume ratio, also, also referred to as body shape, is also highly correlated. So it turns out that the youngest chicks, the week one chicks that are small in size, are the ones with a really high surface area to volume ratio. So they're really lanky compared to the big, fat, round, heavy birds that are about to fledge. Uh, and then the last thing to note on this slide, besides those correlations, is that I've chosen to bin um, surface area to volume ratio into three different categories of regular, thermoregulatory potential. So I'm predicting, basically, that these green birds are, not, are less able to thermoregulate than these purple birds. Okay, so this is a slide you saw earlier, just to remind you that the first question is just simply, can chicks thermoregulate? And I showed you predictions as one graph on the last slide, I've just split them into two here, and here is the real data. So these are all my control pre-handling measurements. And we see that ex a disturbance aside before I handle the birds, um, thermoregulation is definitely happening. So regardless of the ambient temperature, that's the x-axis, um, ch chicks, their core temperature is staying the same. So even at super high ambient temperatures, their core temperature has not changed. It's a non-significant slope. And the way that they do this is by increasing their extremity temperature. So basically their core is heating up, so they send all that heat to their limbs and that's successful at shedding heat to maintain um, their internal temperature. So the answer to the first question is yes, very cool. To complicate, we look to the second question, say, okay, well, does disturbance change this pattern that we see? And in my earlier slide, I gave you this sort of wishy-washy, we're not really sure what this will look like, but I'll take a moment now to break this into two separate predictions. So um, one reasonable prediction is that 
disturbance is going to add so much stress that the animal can no longer effectively thermoregulate. And so in that case, we're going to see increasing um, ex, uh, limb temperatures and increasing core body temperatures, basically saying uh, the animal is not effective at thermoregulation. An alternative reasonable prediction is that maybe animals, these animals, even ass chicks, are just really good at thermoregulating. And so sure, it's an added stress, but they'll still be able to maintain their core temperature. So both of these are reasonable. We have no a priori reason to believe one or the other. But we can look at the data. Um, so on the top graph, this is just the core body temperatures I'm showing you first. The top graph is the control birds pre-handling and the bottom graph is the post-handling disturbed birds. And we see that the trend line changes here, um, and that's really important. So before disturbance, they're able to maintain their core body temperature, but after disturbance, there is a significant increasing slope in the core body temperature, which indicates to me that disturbance, the stress of disturbance is overwhelming um, the thermoregulation response. To, to tie up that story, um, here is the control extremities temperature. So it's increasing, it's trying to thermoregulate and is doing so effectively in the control birds. But the slope of that line does not change after disturbance. And because of that, that, that helps explain why there is an increasing um, core body temperature um, because even though the limb, the limbs are not basically the limbs are not able to compensate um, for the added heat that's generated when you disturb the birds. So this really clearly uh, supports this top prediction that disturbance, the effect of disturbance is overwhelming the thermoregulatory response. And then finally, our third research question is how does this age size surface area to volume ratio question come into play. So we've got chicks that go from very small, you can hold in your hand, to these birds with almost a five foot wingspan. And how does that affect their, their thermoregulation? Um, so I showed you both of these graphs already. These are post handling temperatures, so the disturbed birds. And in the disturbed birds, both the core temperature and the uh, extremities temperature are increasing because uh, disturbance effect is overwhelming the th thermoregulatory response. But what's cool is we can break these out into those different categories that I showed you before. So those categories were to predict the thermoregulatory potential, said that the young chicks with a high surface area to volume ratio, so lots of um, skin basically to absorb heat relative to their mass, uh, so small, and their small mass is going to heat very quickly. So all three of those factors combined tells me that um, the, the, the young chicks have a low thermoregulatory potential versus the very old chicks have a high. And that does play out as we predict when we look at these graphs. So the first thing to notice here is that the young chicks in green, um, in both cases, have just a lower body temperature overall. So here's the raw body temperature on the y-axis and the mean body temperature is just always lower. But it also increases, unlike the, unlike the older chicks that are in purple. So here we see um, in the young chicks in green, increasing core temperature and increasing extremities temperature, um, but that they, and so they are not able to th thermoregulate versus the very old chicks, even though they, so they have bigger volumes that's going to slow, uh, uh, get hot slower, and they are, their increase in external limb temperature is capable of maintaining their uh, core body temperature. So this is cool because it means chicks of different ages and different sizes, these are correlated characteristics, have different thermoregulatory capabilities. So not that shocking, perhaps, but I think it's cool to unpack these um, factors and actually put numbers around our animal in our study system. And so this is my final slide, uh, just to wrap up sort of lessons learned. First is that thermoregulation is definitely happening in these chicks. So yes, they're young, yes, they're developing, but they are capable of thermoregulating. 
The second point is that um, they can effectively thermoregulate when there's no disturbance, but when we disturb the birds as researchers enter in the colony, um, in, in the case of some of the chicks, the disturbance effect overwhelms that thermoregulatory capability. And so we do need to be really careful as researchers about when we enter these, these colonies um, because death by heat stress is, is a real concern. And finally, uh, we talked about how chick age, size, and the shape of these chicks, they're highly correlated. And so it's the, um, it's the young chicks that have a small volume and a very big surface area to volume ratio, and they are less effective at thermoregulating than the old chicks. So not only are they less internally physiologically developed as babies, but also just the characteristics of their size make them more susceptible to heat stress. And so again, as researchers, the implication is that we need to pay not just attention, not just to the environmental temperature, what, how hot is it when we're thinking about going in the colony that day, but we also need to think about how old or what stage our chicks are at. So here in South Florida, um, nest initiation in wood storks happens any time between December and March. So it's this really big range. And so if it's December, um, if it's if it's December, the um, sorry, I got distracted by chat. If it's December, um, the ambient temperature isn't going to be too hot, but you're getting into March and April, you still have very young chicks that are more vulnerable to the heat as the spring warms up. Um, and that's all I have today. So I thank you for coming and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Fantastic, nice job, Kate. Um, we, we have um, plenty of time. We've scheduled an extra um, few minutes here in this session to wrap up cranes and storks. So if you have a question for Kate, we'll start with those. You can either jump in or type into the chat and I'll try to moderate. I've got a question for you, Kate. Um, I'm curious if the species shows um, any uh, parental shading of the chicks to help the chicks thermoregulate. And um, if they do, I mean, it would be cool to see how that changes throughout the season as, as these chicks get better at thermoregulating. Um, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. That's a great question. And it's um, uh, part of the reason I think looking at this question for chicks is interesting because there is a real behavioral component and it's also a reason to be extra concerned about disturbance because that is an adaptive way that adults can help their chicks thermoregulate when they are tiny but when we enter the colony um, the adults fly away. So even my control pre-disturbance birds that have not been handled are not being shaded by the adults. So I haven't been able to address the question that you are asking, but I think it's a great question. And um, the fact that the chicks can thermoregulate even when the adults are gone, but I haven't handled them, tells me that they're even more capable of thermoregulating at hot temperatures when the adults are there. Hi, Kate. Uh, this is Amy Schwarzer, and I was wondering, um, and this may be a hard question, um, but did you have any sense of, of a cutoff of if it's this temperature and your chicks are at this stage, don't do it? It's a great question. Um, and I, I tried, I wanted to get at that because part of the there was a question in one of the agencies of, about whether there should be a threshold written in the permits. And I said, well, we don't have any numbers. How are you gonna make a threshold? Um, and I don't think, just looking at how messy the data were, like trend lines are nice, but there's still so much scatter um, that I, at this point, do not feel comfortable calling a threshold. There's another question here from Suradam. Um, I was wondering whether there's a relation between the heat stress and corticosterone. 
Uh, definitely. So the, that's the part of the stress response is that hormones are released. Um, I haven't dug into that literature very much. I don't know the details of it. Um, but it reminds me back to Amy's question too. I think the condition of the chicks matters a lot probably. And the average chick's condition varies a lot year to year. So if it's a bad year and you're stressed constantly, you have a lot of court maybe in your blood and it's sort of a chronic stress problem, um, that probably affects your thermoregulatory capacity or capability in general as well. Um, so definitely a relationship. I can't give you the details on it, but it's a good question. Here's another uh, question. With your results, how can you change your colony methods to increase chick safety? Great question. Um, I think to me, I'm, we, we, we've always been cognizant of the heat stress problem. I think it reinforces how mindful we need to be of that. So not pushing boundaries too much for the sake of data collection. Um, so permit says avoid mill a day, we avoid mill a day. Um, besides that, there's, there's always a trade-off. Um, and I, it, it seems to be a very personal decision too. So I, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't think, um, I, I think you're always just weighing the risk of how, like how much do you really need the data versus the risk to the chicks. I will say, I should have said in the talk, we did not see any evidence of chicks that had died because of heat stress or anything like that. So yes, we've recorded a stress response, um, but I had no reason to believe that survival was impacted because of the projects that we do. Any other questions for Kate? Uh, from Gopi, would you suspect variations in these patterns between large water bird species nesting in temperate locations versus those that are nesting in the tropics? Ooh. Um, yeah, I mean, what I've touched on today is like very fundamental biology. I don't think I've done anything that isn't already on the books. It's just sort of investigating those same patterns in my study system. So where I would be more worried in temperate environments, and I am thinking of this coming from study systems in Maine, in the Bay of Fundy, Canada, um, we just think less about heat stress period. So, um, Yes, these same limitations apply, but it's maybe not at the forefront of a researcher's mind. So whereas it's less likely that a chick would die of heat stress, it's on those hot days in the field season, you do have to be careful. Um, and one more thing, I'm sorry, I, I had an acknowledgement slide and I just forgot to flip to it after my conclusions, but I had a lot of help um, and so thank you. And I specifically want to thank the Waterbird Society. I got a Kushlin Award to help, that helped support the fieldwork of this project. So um, I really wanted to um, acknowledge that. Hey, Liz, Liz Craig has a question. Yeah. My, my question was very similar to Gopi's. I was, um, I was thinking about how sometimes even in, in temperate or cooler systems like in the Gulf of Maine, um, chicks can still be exposed to warm, maybe extremely warm microclimates, especially when the colony is being disturbed. So yeah, I was curious whether you thought that there might be some differences in the way that maybe different species or different populations might be adapted in terms of their ability to thermoregulate based on the um, the temperatures that they're used to because I was I thought it was really cool to see that your um, extreme warm temperatures in your colony were really close to the internal body temperature of the birds um, at at rest I thought that was really interesting yeah it's a good observation and and you're absolutely right and the breeding breeding season is always warmer here than it would be in a temperate climate so it, it I don't have data on temperate climates. It makes sense that the birds down here would be better adapted for that. And so temperate populations might be more vulnerable in those wonky years when it happens to be hot or something. Any other final questions for Kate? 
or the other presenters. You've been looking at the, the slide. Thank you for attending today's session. A 